Camilla, the fact that her clothes were in Charles' apartment was newsworthy, headlines, and we thought the world was coming to an end. That's all within the last 20 years. It's amazing how fast things change. So it's kind of interesting to understand what's changed for the role of executor, because 20 years ago, we muddled through. We didn't need executor advisors. So what has changed? New family dynamics. The nuclear family of the past, Bobby and Jody here, they ate about a thousand meals a year together. They fought over absolutely everything. When mom and dad died, the family glue held, and they were able to re resolve these state issues without litigating. If we look at the extended modern family of today, we've got mom and dad, stepmom, stepdad, oh, another stepmom, half uncle, stepsister-in-law, and a brother from another mother. <laughs> Some of these people. Honestly, some of these people have only eaten two meals a year together, like at Christmas and Thanksgiving. They haven't fought over anything other than maybe a piece of pie. And when the parents die in this situation, we're going to be left with virtual strangers fighting over illiquid estates already eroded by taxes and exacerbated by unspoken sibling rivalry. These people will sue each other at the drop of a hat. Meet Elena and Ivana. This is just to show you that even good, healthy families can end up in an unbelievable disagreement. This is a true story. Elena, the names are changed. Elena and Ivana's father, mother predeceased, didn't want to differentiate between his two daughters. He named Ivana as his POA for finances and Elena as his executrix. Elena was my client. Guess what happened on the day dad died? Well, Ivana, shake my head, didn't want to lose control of the money. So since checks are only dated but not time-stamped, she figured she could get away with writing this check on her father's account for $10,000 to a law firm with the mandate to bump her sister as the executrix. She didn't want to give up control. That's in a healthy family. Now, I hate to use the term dysfunctional family in my question of what happens in a dysfunctional family because we all know there's no such thing. And this, I think, <coughs> represents that. Number two of the things that have changed for executors, communication and access to information. 20 years ago, we had this strange device. You may or may not recognize it. It was called a telephone. And I know what you're thinking. It has buttons with numbers on it, but you couldn't add anything on it. It was useless. All you could do was phone people. That was it. All of our information came in what we called a newspaper. It was guaranteed to be a minimum of 12 hours old. It should have been called an old paper. <laughs> Speaking of Google, yes, we did have our Google where we got all the information in the world, the Encyclopedia Britannica. None of us ever opened the front jacket to see when it was published, right? Make sure the information was still current. We bought it when the youngest child, or the eldest child was six. It was good until the youngest was 25. That's fine. <laughs> Unbelievable. Now, you think about it in terms of executor positioning. I've got to sell my mother-in-law's house in Regina. My brother-in-law says, I can take care of that for you. I think I can get $300,000 for it. What do I think based on this? I think, great. Thanks very much. Let me know how it goes. Call me on that telephone if I can help. End of conversation. Now we look at where we are today, where we've got smartphones, iPads, desktops, laptops, Google, now I go to realtor.ca, Regina, drill down in the neighborhood of my mother-in-law's house. I see the average selling price is $350,000, not $300,000. Think, what's going on here now? Oh, and then I remember my brother-in-law went to school in Regina. He's probably selling it to a friend of his. That's what's going on here. Am I going to pick up the phone? No. I don't need to do that. I've got Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, brother-in-law dumping assets. I can tweet that. <laughs> How long did that take? Five minutes? Not even. You see, our access to information and our ability to communicate has changed so drastically. It's changed everything. Complexity of assets. The post-settlement cup of tea 20 years ago. My mother had a GIC. And today, my mother had a GIC and an RRSP, TFSA, Lira, RIF, LRIF, PRIF, LIF, RDS, BRE, SP, DB, DC, IBB, IRB, DB, SP, RCA. Unbelievable! 
Every single one of these has a slightly different tax consequence. Get it wrong, get sued. And we're expecting average Canadians to navigate this. You don't think executors need your help when you look at this? It's ridiculous to think this is still a DIY function. And speaking of taxes, average number, or sorry, number of tax returns Canadian executors should consider filing. Six. I always tell people, you know, if you can't name them, you probably shouldn't be doing them. And I successfully refer to CDA accountants 100% of the time. There is simply no way an average Canadian should be trying to do estate tax returns. Increased risk of personal liability. There are 18 areas with supporting case law where negligence by the executor can result in personal liability to the beneficiaries and creditors of the estate. Those would be the litigants. What Scott is saying, I don't know what this is going to look like, is that there are 18 different ways that the executor can be sued personally. Now, Scott is the president of Ayrshire Executor Insurance. The fact that this job is so dangerous that you can buy insurance to protect you, that should be reason enough for alarm. And in many cases, that is the conversation starter that I have. I ask people about their wills. I ask if there's been provision for payment of premiums for executor insurance, because if there hasn't been, who pays the premiums for that insurance? The beneficiaries are gonna say, well, that's only covering his butt, so he should pay it. And he's gonna say, hey, if I'm on a construction site, I need boots and a hard hat, coats with a job, the estate should pay it. And that's gonna be one of our first sources of conflict. But what I get out of that is also the fact that the testators start to say, uh, hold on, Mark, why would my daughter need insurance? What have I got her into? That's the conversation that I want to have. Scott also wrote the chapter on risk in our program, by the way. In addition to that, Ontario has made changes to the collection of the EAT, the estate administration tax. As I said, Ontario does things a little differently. This is what we call probate fees in Ontario, but we do have a sense of humor, acronym EAT, final bite. <laughs> Responsibility for collection moved from justice to revenue. Justice just said, this is how you calculate the fee, and here's the address where you mail the check, full stop. Revenue has audit authority, and they have sharp teeth. The new penalties range from $1,000 to twice the value of the EAT payable. That's 3% of the estate approximately, or incarceration of up to two years, or both. And you can't see that, but what it says is that on an estate of a million dollars, the maximum financial fine is $29,000 per executor. We got that part. More to the point, I think you have to understand that if you fill out a form wrong in Ontario now, you can go to jail. You think about that. If your aunt calls up and says, will you be my executor or executrix, and you're thinking about this, if I get it wrong, I could be writing checks for tens of thousands of dollars or I could be going to jail? No, get somebody else. I don't want to take that on. Or put another way, if they're working with a CEA, it's like literally having a get out of jail free card because the CEA has enough knowledge to direct people away from the potential pitfalls and to the professionals that they need while helping them within their own area of expertise. The CEA is a broad, diverse, practical program designed to provide enough information to engage with executors and become a valuable and trusted resource. And this is what it looks like. It's broken down into seven modules in the exam. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. We talk about the duties, the overview of what needs to be done. And then we go to the financial. I'll pause here for a moment because this is kind of interesting. If you think about all of the people that you currently work with on a referral basis, how many of them fully appreciate the value of what you do? How many understand how important life insurance is to Canadian families, really? How many understand the role of corporate insurance, really? Well, if you encourage them to take our program, and the idea behind it is it makes it so much easier to refer you, so much easier for us to do team seminars and so forth, then they are going to learn the value of what you do. And imagine when you're talking to funeral directors even, who have learned enough to understand that insurance is important, to understand name beneficiary stuff, 
They know what you do. They at least have enough knowledge that when they say, look, you don't want to just talk to any old financial advisor because it isn't just about investment returns. There's a whole lot of other stuff. You need to talk to this financial advisor. There's some credibility there. And likewise, when you're talking about the importance of pre-preparing and pre-arranging a funeral, you're speaking from the heart because you understand it because you've covered that in module one. Looking at property in its broadest terms, Looking at trusts, you probably whizzed through this, but this is from the executor perspective. What do they need to know? Looking at estates, the process, tax returns, and so forth. Having that credibility to be able to refer those accounts and so forth. The fun part, the challenges, dealing with beneficiaries, illiquid estates, insufficient assets, mistakes and abuses of authority. All the areas where executors can get themselves in trouble. You learn about those things so you can help them. And then the benefits. Module 7 is all about how you monetize it because I get this. I've been in the eat what you kill business my whole life. And I understand that if you can't make money doing something, it is never going to survive. It's never going to last. So I want to help you make sure you're making money and all of the professions that you're working with are making money. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that out loud. And finally, we have the online exam. You take it whenever you want, 70% passing grade, and that you become a CEA. This is a online learning platform, purpose-built. You can highlight online, you can take notes online, do a full search functionality. It is the most user-friendly course you have ever seen. It's written in newspaper-level English because we're explaining complex concepts like per capita versus per stirpes distribution to realtors, funeral directors, PNC brokers, not to say that these people aren't smart, but they have never seen this stuff before. And we wanna make it easy to explain. The whole program is written with that in mind. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. The simple answer is you get CE from every organization in insurance and finances across Canada. By being a CEA, you have a much wider referral network by profession. 16 other professions <coughs> referring business to you. And by geographical region, we have a find a CEA directory that provides uh, search functionality by profession and by region. And we have recently established the Certified Executive Advisor Network. It's taken two years to build this. It's a standalone not-for-profit. Its mandate is to open chapters across Canada to bring the 17 professions together face to face to share business ideas, knowledge, referrals, marketing strategies, and so forth. And they're all rolling out right now from Halifax to Vancouver. The tools you'd expect and more, uh, I, I don't have nearly enough time to go through this, but just to touch on some things. For example, when the executor calls you up and says, okay, I'm doing the job, what do I do? And you don't want to be doing that. You don't want to be rolling up your sleeves. This is just one tool, it's a notifications list. And I, I know the font's too small, but the first one there is Service Canada. All the departments that they need to notify, the numbers of the forms that they need to submit to do it, and the ancillary information that each of those departments is going to ask for. It makes their job so much easier. You will not find this anywhere on the internet because no provider of executor services wants to help the DIY executor. Great resource. When you do have that executor testator meeting, you're not starting from scratch. This is a form that you can walk through that uncovers all of the potential problems and business opportunities for you. Already done. We have planning concepts. I didn't have time to get into this. This is another of the easiest sales in the world in the case of secondary marriages. This is called crisscross RIF insurance, where they are leaving the RIF assets to their children instead of one another because of second marriages. And what they're doing is they're losing the spousal rollover provision. So we bring that back in by buying the amount of insurance that the children would have otherwise received, which is 50%. And that translates into two single life sales in the senior market. And it's literally like selling life insurance for half price because you buy a policy for $100,000 and you receive on the partner's debt $200,000 of RIF capital. So if you're buying, paying for 100 and you're receiving 200, not just tax-free, but also tax-sheltered, because you're a spouse. As I said, easy, easy sales. This is another one on uh, uh, 
insured the crisis. We